So my first question to her is, I bet you're on a Mac, aren't you, Christina? <laughs> no. No wonder Allie hates things. I hate Apple. <laughs> Leave Apple alone, Ryan. They've got their own problems. They're so big. They're so easy to pick on. This is the AT Banter Podcast. A balanced and entertaining look at assistive technology, accessibility, and its importance in people's lives. Join Rob Minnell, Ryan Flurry, and Steve Barclay as they banter with people around the world about anything and everything regarding assistive technology and the disability community. Now, on with the show. Hey, and welcome to another episode of AT Banter. Banter, banter. Hey, hey, that was slightly demonic. <laughs> Is that the type of Monday you're having? <laughs> no, it's been a good day so far. Yes. Uh, hey, my name is Rob Minot. Uh, joining me today, Mr. Ryan Flurry. Howdy day. Uh, we are down one today. Again. Um, Steve Barkley is out sick today. You're working too hard. Poor guy. Yep. The boss called in sick. Uh, you know, it's that time of year where the you know season is changing and people are getting colds and flus and... Yeah, well, his fam, him and his family are <laughs> especially or susceptible. Infamous. To, <laughs> should call him Typhoid Stevie. Yeah. No, he hasn't been sick for quite a while. He was saying so. Mm -hmm. This one seemed to have caught him off guard, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as long as he's not here spreading uh, disease down here in the Guitar Dungeon. That's right. right. That's so, disinfect uh, the place. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you see Bohemian Rhapsody yet? No. Oh, you gotta go see it. Oh, did you go see it? Yeah, so hmm. a couple weeks ago. It's actually really good. Hmm, interesting. It's worth seeing. I may do that. Yeah, it was it was well done. Did you see it in uh, with like descriptive audio? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it went to the and they them Silver City and and it worked. It worked. Yeah, it was my first experience. Damn. Yeah, it was my very first experience watching a described video at the movie theater. Yeah, it was very seamless. I took earbuds though. I think next time I'm, I'm probably going to take a set of these headphones. Yeah. Because what I noticed with the earbuds in is the theaters are pretty loud. And I could still hear the descriptive, but I had to keep pumping the volume up and then down and up and then down. Oh, yeah. Because every time, you know, there was dialogue, I'd have to turn it up. And then when they start singing, I'd have to turn it down. And, right. And the earbuds don't really filter out the outside noise, right? So if I took a pair of these, at least my ears would be covered and I could still hear. Cool. And yeah. so is it just, do you have to sp sit in a specific seat that nope. has everything plugged in now? No, nope. no, nope. they give you a wireless receiver. Yeah. And basically you turn it on and, you know, you, you don't get the, the, the trailers and ads all described. This the description doesn't actually start until the movie starts. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you just basically turn it on, plug your headphones in, and once the movie starts, it starts playing. Hey, that's slick. Yeah, it worked really well. I was when it really works. impressed. Well, that's just it. You know, maybe, I, my maybe first experience upgraded. worked, so... Maybe it didn't and didn't cost any more to go. Didn't cost well. We went to the VIP theater, right? So, uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, automatically pays you a little bit more, but sure. Oh, but, that's, that experience is so worth it. Oh, that's what I said to Linda. I said, you know, we just order. They come around. You order your food. They bring yep. it to you. It's you a beautiful know, thing. It's expensive. You can go early. You know, we've gone early and and just sat in the in the lounge area for like you know yeah. an hour and a half, and it's like a pub. You yeah, can get pub food and stuff, and and then walk right into your movie. It's it's pretty great. Yeah. This is, you know, it's expensive after your tickets and your popcorn. It's 20 and, bucks. It's know. 20 bucks, yeah. But, no, it's definitely worth the better audio and, you know, the description, like I said, worked right out of the box. So, uh, so Ryan, why don't you tell the fine people uh, what we're doing today? Today we're speaking with Christina Sheldon, who is a Vancouver singer, songwriter, musician, who is also a board member on the Vancouver Adaptive Music Society. She, she has had a spinal cord injury in her past, which I believe has given her a bit of nerve damage and stuff. So right. um, she's also, you know, been a member of, of VAMS and VAMS, I think, was uh, was pretty key in her recovery. So it'll be kind of cool to hear somebody who has both an, uh, sort of an inside view of, uh, of how VAMS operates as well as being somebody who benefited uh, greatly from uh, from the the work that the uh, Vancouver Adapted Music Society does the power of music it's cool to do a music episode every once in a while yeah uh, but hey before we do that uh, let's dive into some news <laughs> the news 
Uh, hey, speaking of uh, Apple from last week's episode, uh, did you see this article over the weekend um, that Microsoft has now uh, passed Apple on Friday as the most valuable company? It's going to flip flop. Yeah, Apple passed Microsoft uh, back in 2010. Oh, um, and it has been on top since then. And uh, like we were talking about, Apple is, is kind of sliding a little bit and other companies are catching up and Microsoft passed Apple once again. And uh, they've got a market cap of $851 billion. And I wonder what's kind of put them over the top. You know, is it their Surface tablets? Is it their Xbox, is it their gaming division? No. Well, really what it is is that... You know, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, demand for for smartphones has flatlined a little bit mm -hmm. in the past few years, and uh, I think that's what has really caused a little bit of a backslide. Microsoft just has has more varied products right. that they don't have to worry about that. And a larger it's, it's not it's not hitting Microsoft quite as hard as it's hitting Apple. Yeah, because and I Microsoft has all these you know other products to um, to fall back on. Yeah, and I think I saw a number, I think, and I'm going to get this wrong, but I think Apple had, I don't know, 8% market share in the in the PC market. You know, Microsoft had, you know, whatever the balance is, you know, 80%. Um, and then, of course, Linux and others out there. But, you know, Microsoft has always had, you know, the, the corner on the PC market. And Apple, I think, has always leveraged, you know, their their technical ability on the smartphone market. And, you know, like you say, you know, that, that's flatlining now. There's not a lot of innovations going on. Smartphone to smartphone to smartphone, for the most part, nowadays. Right. Or correct me if I'm wrong, audience. No, it's true. But that's true. Well, I agree with you. I don't know about the <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you know, uh, there's, you know, there's innovation, I guess, in, in, in AR and VR and AI. But, you know, I saw an article again this morning that companies are starting to look at 5G smartphones and apple probably won't have one till 2020 and i'd be willing to bet there's going to be other companies out there on the android side of things who are releasing 5g smartphones next year uh but yeah but honestly like as a consumer uh, i could give a crap about 5g like that means nothing to me my phone goes as fast, fast already <laughs> already i don't need 5g i i don't think any of that is really going to impact i i really honestly i think that Innovation in terms of what these phones can do, they can pretty much do everything that anybody needs them to do. So all these really, you know, things I think that the that the manufacturers think are, are real bells and whistles. I think for the most part, and again, I'm I'm speaking for myself mm -hmm. and my gut instinct. So what do I know? But as a consumer, it, it doesn't I, like it's not like I would go out and spend a lot of money on a new phone just because it had five G. I right. mean it really doesn't even factor into my decision making at all right and that could be just you know our demographic or our use case scenarios you know sure so uh, but anyways not to pile on apple any more than we already did uh last well, week they're making but, news but i mean look this the the landscape is shifting and, and it's an important thing to to point out that um, other companies are catching up to apple and i think that that's a good thing i mean it, certainly in terms of uh accessibility uh, it's it's excellent that Microsoft is is making all these um, leaps and bounds, you know, especially with their their built-in accessibility. Narrator is becoming really really good, which uh, which is heartening. It is indeed. All right. Okay. The other big news uh, last week is that Canada's House of Commons has unanimously passed Bill C eighty one, which is the proposed Accessible Canada Act, which in turn, is going to send the bill to the Senate. You know, I, I will fully admit that I am one of these people that really don't understand completely how Canadian politics works and how all this, how bills become laws and acts and all that. But I guess the next stage is that it goes to the Senate for debate, for debate and a vote, which uh, I, I'm sure that they expect it to to go right through. I don't see any uh, anything that that could potentially hold this up um, we've needed a you know a, a national accessibility act for many years and so it's about time that this is all happening so the, this is good news it means that it's one step closer to becoming a thing but there are there are some groups out there that aren't happy with 
the bill as it is. Well, and speaking of that, there the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance is one of those people. Uh, they have a, a fairly lengthy, lengthy article on their website about some of their misgivings about the act and how they're a little concerned that uh, when it was being debated that some of the amendments that were made to the bill might take a, a bit of the teeth out of this. And that may be true. You know, we don't have all the facts yet. If everything that people wanted was in this bill, it was too aggressive. And that's why... You think so? I, probably. Well, probably. I don't know. Um, now, I'm not a, I'm saying, because I don't know what the bill contained, I'm not saying it was too aggressive. It's probably what was needed in Canada to actually have some teeth and some, you know, reinforcement behind it, some um, repercussions to companies and agencies who didn't follow or obey the act. But we have something, we have a structure in place that we can build upon now. So, you know, yeah, we maybe didn't get everything we wanted, but at the same time, we got something. Well, I think that this, you know, it's important that organizations like the, the AODA are making noise about this because that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. It's important to be critical of of what the act does i think especially at this stage before it actually goes into law because once it's in law it's going to become a lot harder to to make changes to it so um and it's important that that the community that this this act is going to be in service to you know have have their voice in the process so i think that they're you know all, all these um all these criticisms that they have, and it, it's fairly lengthy, and, and I think I'll, I'll include this in the show notes so people can take a look at both what was, what's in the act and what was sort of taken out and what the, the, the AOD's take on some of that is. It, it's, it's very interesting reading, and it's important to know where some of the holes are, are appearing in, in, the, in the legislation because... It's going to be important because this, this thing is going to be in place for years and years and years and years to come. And you're absolutely right, Ryan. It's going to act as a foundation for everything going forward. So it's important that we get as much right initially as we can. Absolutely. I totally agree. We'll include the link to this uh, great article on the, on the AODA um, webpage that sort of goes through everything that was announced and everything... A lot of the things that are in C81 and voices their concerns with that. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good and an interesting read. So, Hey, Steve, why don't you tell the fine folks about Canadian Assistive Technology? Well, Canadian Assistive Technology is a Canadian-based distributor of, guess what, Assistive Technology. I would not have guessed that. Uh, really? Oh, i got to work something better into the name then. <laughs> um, and uh, we do uh, all kinds of low vision and blindness aids, as well as all kinds of physical access aids and uh, accessible furniture, you name it. Visit our website at www.canastech.com. Rick, let me ask you about this. Chaos Technical Services. Chaos Technical Services. Don't sound so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Speaking of repairs. We are the sister company to Canas Tech. Um, we do the repairs on uh, low vision devices, uh, uh, reading machines uh, for libraries, braille printers, and pretty well anything in between. We can be found at uh, www.chaostechnicalservices.com. So joining us now is Christina Sheldon, who is a Vancouver singer-songwriter and a board member of the Vancouver Adaptive Music Society. Hi, Ryan. And in the room with me is my co-host with the most, Rob Minot. Hello. Hi, Rob. Stop saying I have the most because <laughs> that puts way too much pressure on me. I don't necessarily have the most. I have a lot, but I wouldn't say I have the most. You got a lot of rock. You got a lot of rockets with you today. That's true. Oh my God, Brian gave me like a, a you know, uh, like I, I don't even know. It's like a gazillion. We rockets. had a bowl full of leftover Halloween candy, and my wife and I don't like rockets, and so I said to Rob here take them and i love rockets i can it's one of the things that's my weakness i'll probably eat my weight in them i'll probably be dead tomorrow <laughs> because they'll just find me on my apartment floor in sugar shock 
Uh, anyways. Anyways. We digress. We digress. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens a lot. Should we try that in harmony? <laughs> yeah, really, right? Four, four part. Oh, geez. So where do we start, Ryan? Where, what? Uh... Well, where do we start? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I was like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Rob actually sent me a link to the interview you did with CBC. And that's, mm-hmm. how, that's how, you know, I don't know how he came across that article, but that's, you know, why we kind of wanted to reach out to you. I'm totally blind myself and, and our stories are actually quite similar. So kind of a no brainer to get you on the show and, and maybe talk a little bit about your story. Talk about, you know, the Vancouver Adaptive Music Society. Well, let, OK, so let's start out in, in telling us a little bit about um, yourself and um, maybe about the accident and sort of where you were with music before it and, and, and how you sort of found your way to VAMS afterwards. Um, well, I've been a musician my entire life, been a singer um, since I was a little girl, annoying the crap out of my dad while I watched The Little Mermaid. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, I was, I was in choirs and, and I was in uh, musicals when I was younger. I couldn't stop singing. It was just, it was just you know, one of those things that I fell in love with and there was no stopping me. Um, I, yeah, when I was in high school, I picked up the guitar and I started learning how to songwrite. And that was absolutely magical moment for me because I didn't realize it was something that I could do. It always seemed like one of those far off things, like you only super talented major musician songwrite. And then I was writing my own. I was like, wow, this is is fun. This is exciting. And, and it was, it's, I think, I think it's, there's something inside me, like the soul of a poet, you know, when you, when you're able to pull out those thoughts and feelings and make something tangible and corporeal in front of you. And it's, it's one of the most satisfying feelings I have ever experienced. Um, my dad wanted me to do something practical with my life. <laughs> he wanted me to be a pharmacy tech or something. Hmm. And, um, yeah, so when I went, to, I wanted to go to, to college and he said that if I wanted to go to college and live under his roof, then I had to take a practical course. So I moved out (laughs) (laughs) and took music. (laughs) How bohemian. Um, Yeah. That's great. Love you, Dad. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, there's no blaming him, of course. He just wanted me to have like Mm -hmm. a strong financial backing to make sure that I was set up for the rest of my life. I don't blame him one bit for for thinking that way. It's just I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, And uh, I knew I would drown, so to speak emotionally if I did it, sure. which might sound kind of dramatic, but I think a lot of artists tend to be over dramatic. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, so I went, um, after a year of basic, uh, musicianship at Douglas college, oh. I was gonna, um, I was busking and I was getting performances and things were sort of, um, accelerating in my life musically. Um, but that summer I got into the car accident that broke my neck. Things sort of changed there. Now, now, when you went into basic musicianship, were you were you planning on entering into the um, the university transfer um, music program? I, I actually went to Douglas as well for basic musicianship. So. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I was gonna. Yes, uh, my plans were definitely to move forward. I actually ultimately wanted to get into the cap the um, the cap so, jazz program. Right. Okay. Because jazz has always spoken to me, um, and as interesting as it was to train classically, and I think very helpful in terms of just learning music. It just wasn't where my heart lay. Um, and so I was, yeah, I was definitely thinking about moving on to, to jazz. Now, now was good, was, was um, voice or guitar your, your main? Voice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to be told, I only ever learned enough guitar to write music. Okay. I was never a guitarist. I, <laughs> I would basically learn um, the chords of a song that I liked, and then immediately I didn't play that song and started writing my own song using the new chords I just learned. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, um, and very little piano studies in my life as well. Um, yes, I did yeah. want to. I did want to um, study more because I knew there would be it would be a real door opener when it comes to music as well. But. Um, yeah, again, the accident kind of changed that plan. Yeah. Right. So, you, so you did. You had you had sort of your next four years all planned, but then mm-hmm. the accident. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about that then, specifically. So, um, w- what exactly happened? And, and so, you say you broke your neck. Yeah, I was in a car accident. I was driving up to Kelowna, and uh, it was a single motor vehicle accident. Um, and I was half ejected from the car, and the seatbelt wrapped around my neck and locked. 
immediately I couldn't move. Um, and I'm actually extremely lucky uh, because somebody was behind me and he, I guess he had a seatbelt cutter um, and he cut the seatbelt, which is fortunate because I was suffocating. Mm. Yeah. And I still have no idea who that man is. Uh, I think mm. I said it in the CBC radio and if he's listening to this one too. No. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what was the recovery like on that one? Yeah. So when I first came out of surgery, yes, I was fully paralyzed, um, told I had a 10% chance to walk again. No one really knew what kind of recovery I was going to have. Um, and so I was extremely fortunate insofar that I, I did have a pretty, pretty phenomenal recovery. Um, I was five weeks at, uh, Vancouver general hospital and seven weeks at GS strong, um, physical rehabilitation center. Yep. And I walked out. Wow. Well, I limped out, but <laughs> yeah. so, um, I am, I am ambulatory. I can walk now. Uh, I do have a permanent limp. Um, and I tend to call myself invisibly injured because I'm walking and I don't really have any aids to, to show people. And mm. I've noticed that humanity really is a visual entity yeah. and without the visual aids to, to prove my disability, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, had, I've run into some, um, some issues, but I deal with chronic pain, spasticity, fatigue, um, um, altered sensation, nerve damage. In fact, I'm staring at a beautiful blister I apparently gave myself last night by burning it on something. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't feel it. <laughs> 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 it's little silver linings, right? Yeah. Oh, that and mosquito bites. I can't feel mosquito bites. So. Oh, nice. Oh, that that's a perk. <laughs> yeah. That's a superpower. Although we don't recommend a car accident just to avoid no. the sting of mosquito <laughs> <laughs> Avoid a few inches. No, I don't. Right. <laughs> but uh, so maybe we can step back and talk a little bit about about this—the whole idea of the, the invisible disability—and and like, do you, is is that kind of a, a bit of frustrating for frustration for you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, there, I mean, it's actually kind of a complex issue issue dealing with disability, acquiring a disability, accepting that you have a disability being stubborn and not wanting the disability and, or working hard to get as much recovery as you can. And anyway, just having this added, um, challenge of people just having zero clue that you are dealing with something challenging mm -hmm. <laughs> and that you are working hard. Like I get, I get told, I'm, I used to get told that I was lazy a lot, or I was getting that impression from a lot of people that they mm -hmm. thought that I was being lazy, that I was like, cause I, I can bail on events, um, because if I'm having a pain flare, up, I'm not going anywhere. Right. right. And um, I've lost friends because they just couldn't wrap their brains around. They thought, well, you were just, you're just being lazy. You're just copping out. I'm like, no, I, mm. I swear I want to be there, yeah. <laughs> yep. but I can't. And so, yeah, I've lost friends, um, um, had challenges with my family for the first little while. My dad didn't get it. He's like, why aren't you, why aren't you working? Why aren't you back to full-time working? I'm like, I'll never be full-time <laughs> working. He's like, but you're walking. And that's, yeah. One of the issues that, and I, again, don't blame my dad for him. Um, he's going to kill me if he ever hears this. <laughs> 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 it's just one of those things that anyone would say. And I've heard from so many people, but you're walking. Like, yeah. and I, I thought that when I was going um, on a flight once, I was trying to get through security, but the main security line was just so long and trying to stand and wait in that line the whole time. It wasn't going to happen. I was, I, I would have it would have been an extreme challenge. So I chose to take the handicap line, which was, which was empty. And I even was prepared. And I was like, look, I have ID. And but the first thing the guy says to me, is like, you're not disabled. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, no, but I am. I even have ID. I know it doesn't really look like it. he's like, no, you're wearing a backpack. You're not disabled. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, that's the criteria. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I've, I've run into multiple issues. Um, and to be fair, my dad is, Absolutely phenomenal and amazing. Um, it just took a bit of an adjustment period um, to kind of understand and and get that without the visual cues, yep. there's still so much happening on underneath the surface of, of me. And when you just sit and like for just having coffee, I don't look like I have a disability in any way, shape or form. No one could know that at that exact moment, I'm in so much pain, I'm barely crying. It's, yeah. Yeah. And this is something that I've had. I've had conversations with other ambulatory disabled people or other in, who identify as invisibly injured because there's yeah, a whole yes. bunch of other things. Yep. Right. I, I've learned about like brittle bone or something or yep. so many different forms of this. And everyone says the same thing. It's 
it's really challenging because humans like a visual cue. Mm-hmm. Yes. Without that visual cue, you must be lying. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and quite often, you know, we, we hear similar stories um, within the, you know, the visually impaired community. Um, you know, there are people out there that that certainly have a, a visual impairment. It may even be legally blind, but they don't necessarily need to sort of have a cane or a or, dog. Or a dog. Or, yeah. And, you know, again, they run into the same issues where people will look at them and be like, yeah, well, you know, you're not. You, you don't look disabled. Yeah. So. Yeah. You don't. You, I mean, you're, but you, you, you can see, so you're not blind. Yeah. And That's right. Yeah, yeah. I've had that. I've actually, I have a friend who's, um, has a visual impairment and is legally blind. And I, I was thinking about that because I was doing it myself where I was like, but because she she gets along quite well, like if it wasn't for her guide dog, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't really know. And um, yeah, I remember thinking that myself, just like, but how can you be called blind if you can see? <laughs> so, again, it's what it's just there's a lot of lack of information. Yep, and I yep. don't think that most people mean to be mean. They just don't know. Yeah. They, they don't understand. I mean, they don't understand that there's gradients to everything, right. um, you know, including disability. And yeah, like when I say I'm quadriplegic, because technically I am quadriplegic, they're like, but you're not, but you're moving. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so there, there seems to be, a, I, and I, I don't know where this information has come across, but if you're blind, you're fully blind, meaning you can't see at all. If you're quadriplegic, <laughs> you're fully quadriplegic, high level, complete, mm. not moving anything. And it, yeah, I think there needs to be more education. There needs to be more information yep. out there for people to go, no, no, no. Gradients of all of these things, still all valid, still all needing the help. Yes. <laughs> so we can do things slightly better than the absolute worst. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're a okay. You know, we still right. do need help in some situations. Right. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to talking a little bit about music and, and maybe how, you know, a- after the accident, where, where did sort of music land for you? Like, did you really think, did you think that, okay, well that's it. I like, I'm never, music is just never going to be a thing for me ever again. Or, or were you always confident that you were like, I'm going to recover and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be involved in, in music some, some way, somehow. You know, interesting. No, I actually thought that although I was stubborn from the very beginning and imagined that I was going to have a full and complete recovery, I think my heart broke immediately. Um, and I thought that music was done for me because I couldn't play guitar anymore. And um, that was actually one of the most crushing experiences out of my accident because Prior to then, anytime I had been feeling some sort of emotional trauma and I needed to get it out, it, my therapy was picking up my guitar and writing a song about it. Right. And that's how I felt better about, you know, the things that were going bad in my life. And it was a therapy that was tried and true and worked for me. And here I was going through one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. And my therapist and I couldn't talk to each other. Right. And um, so for a long, long time, I... I'm I'm also a little embarrassed that I, I kind of gave up on myself and I didn't even try because well I, I tried but every time I picked up my guitar I couldn't do it and I cried and it was worse so I was like screw this I'm not doing this like <laughs> right right um and so I let it go for a long time because my left hand has the most ner- nerve damage and um even still I can't play guitar um so what it took and I'm really grateful for VAMS Vancouver Adaptive Music Society for for showing me that just because you know you have just because you can't do it the way you could before doesn't mean you can't still do it right and i mean that applies to way more than just music but i needed them to show me that for music because i was so used to doing it that one particular way and i was pretty darn stubborn about needing that way back that it took me a long time to figure out that there were other ways and um and I mean, the truth is once music's in your soul, it, it never actually goes away. It was just waiting for me to figure it out. <laughs> so while you were going through rehab, like how did you find out about VAMS? Like, did you, did they come to you and say, you know, we understand you have a musical background, you know, here's some of the services we can offer to help with your rehab or like, how did that all come about? Uh, no, they didn't. Although um, if they don't, still do that. That's actually something I'm going to bring to the board of directors next meeting and say, we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, but they have um, a studio in GF Strong. Right. Oh, that's and right. So it was actually on the way to the physio, to the gym. 
And so every time I was going to the gym, I would pass by this door that said music yeah. and I would always be peering at it and every once in a while it'd be open and I'd peek in and, and eventually I started, you know, just talking with them. And at first there wasn't, um, t- too much going on, or I think a lot of it had to, had to be self promoted. Yeah. Like they had the, the equipment there and you could use it if you wanted, but you really had to push yourself into the studio, make volunteer time, find the volunteer time or for like, sorry, find the volunteer hours that are open. Um, so I at least put my name down on, on things, but I was definitely not self-motivated enough at that point because I was still literally relearning how to walk. Yeah. Right. Um, and still, you know, crushed about a lot of different things. It's very, very, uh, emotionally upheaval kind of time yes so did that give you a bit of a, a glimmer of hope though like even though you're going through rehab did that you know walk rolling past that door that said music and knowing there was a studio behind that door it did it, yeah know. i'll admit it did for sure it was a hope i was afraid to hope but yeah. but yes <laughs> because um i mean the truth is i did recover phenomenally well and there are people who have less function than me who are musicians mm-hmm. perfect example dave simington he has right. less function than me and he's a phenomenal drummer right and it was sort of like seeing that and and eventually accepting that because a big part of acquiring a disability is accepting that no you may not get back to where you were and yes you can do things as you are because there's a weird sort of dance you have to play between um, not giving up on future recovery and accepting who you are. Um, it definitely gave me, gave me hope. And, and I'm so glad that I had that option to pursue because I'm not 100% that I would have gotten back into music quite like I did without that Avenue, which maybe is a pretty bold thing to say, because as I said, when music's in your soul, you just can't give up on it. I started singing again naturally mm-hmm. as things sort of progressed at first, my diaphragm was really affected, so even getting out one sentence was a challenge. So never mind singing. So that's kind of also where that was. It was right. like I I can't do anything. Um, but as I strengthened and as my 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 diaphragm kind of came back, my core kind of came back just a little bit or enough at least to support my voice. Um, I just started singing again. And one of the cooler things is that at this point in my life, I feel like I sing better than I did pre-injury. <laughs> wow. So I don't know how that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe a little bit about what the what the actual VAM studio was and what kind of uh, adaptive uh, equipment that they had for you in particular and, and what you were able to do there? Yeah. Okay. So the studio um, was actually pretty small at the time, um, but it had tons of different um, adaptive uh, instrument pieces in there. Um, so say if you want to p- play drums, but you don't really have a lot, a lot in, um, of movement in your hands, they have like Dave Simington uses these particular gloves that have, that have his sticks attached. And then he uses what's called octopads, I think they're called. And there is, it's, it's, um, it's like a drum kit, but it's just those pads right. instead of like the full drum kit. And he gets all the sounds he wants, um, within his range of motion. Um, and there were other things that I actually never really learned about personally, but there are adaptive ways to play guitar. Um, I think his name is Richard Kwan. I know he plays guitar now, but he plays it on his lap. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, yeah, there's, yeah. Um, also there is the full studio in there. So they have, you have the ability to record, um, you know, songs or records within the studio. Um, to be honest, I didn't really use the studio that much. Uh, but what ended up happening for me is Vams puts on these wonderful uh, collaborative things with other musicians in the community. Right. Um, so they did uh, Music Saves videos. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> yeah I saw that. I, that I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, feeling yeah, all feeling right. All right. Yeah. That, that was a great video. Yeah. Yeah. So they asked me to be involved in that. And that was one of my stepping stones. Well, first, actually, I was, I got to meet Bobby Style, who's a a music producer and a um, talented musician, um, who also has a a disability. Um, Absolutely love that guy. But he's, his music is is a little bit different from me. He's, I think, a bit more goth and a bit more, excuse me, sort of rock. Right. Um, whereas I'm more indie folk, jazzy lullaby lady. <laughs> so, uh, but then I got involved with the music saves videos and that was so much fun. Um, just being able to collaborate, collaborate with these heavyweight, um, yeah. Canadian musicians like yep. the odds, Craig Northey and Jim Burns and Barney Bentall. 
Barney Bentall, the Bentall brothers, they were so fun. They were one of the first people that I met and they were so nice and so just inclusive. And I was like, this is awesome. How could I ever think that I wouldn't be doing music again? (laughs) (laughs) And it was just so fun to be given that opportunity to be put in a position where I could sing again. And that's what they got me to do is just sing um, some backup vocals um, in one of the videos. And and that led to me singing on stage at um, the the Video Saves premieres. And I got back up on stage and I got to tell you, that is where I belong. That's my home. Mm-hmm. And it, it just felt so good. So that's sort of where it started for me um, was just them being like, well, hey, we know that you like to sing. Would you like to participate in this? And then I did. And it just kind of reignited that fire in me and really showed me all the different um, levels of ability, physical ability, musical ability, and you know that they're just ways to take partake if you yeah. can find them. So who 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 put who put the ukulele in your hand? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, who's to <the> okay, blame? So- <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one on my wall too, so I can't complain too much. But I just had this wonderful image of somebody being like. Here. That's right. You can't play guitar, but here you get yeah, the li- you get the little guitar. <laughs> well, I guess that's sort of the progression went from me doing those Van videos and then um, me starting to believe a little bit more, kind of just fiddling on on piano occasionally. I lived with a roommate who had a, a digital keyboard, and I was kind of fiddling with it, and I was like, I think maybe I can kind of get away with this because my right hand works a little bit um, better than my left. So I can get across a decent treble line and just kind of do super basic notes, uh, basic bass notes. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so the first time I started writing again was on the piano. um, And that was probably one of the most exciting recovery moments, uh, aside from learning, like actually standing up again. (laughs) (laughs) For me, is being able to write again and and, and doing it that way. So no, my piano lines, they are not majestic. They are not concert worthy, but they get... They, they have the, I just at least had the bass that I need to get the music out. And then um, as I was going along, I so people kept mentioning ukulele and I kept thinking ukulele hmm. because it's only four strings yeah, and right. they're soft nylon strings and the chords are way simpler. Although I didn't know that. <laughs> Seriously, you, you just press one, one finger on one string and you got a C chords. Chorus. Oh, really? And you just slide it down and up, and then you get this whole like fun ukulele. Anyway, <laughs> grab my ukulele, I can play for you right now. <laughs> I got I um, got to get ukulele lessons. It sounds fun. Yeah, and everything sounds like sunshine and happiness on ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, even my sad songs, just you're just kind of like, yeah, hey, bopping along. I'm on the beach. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I joined a band actually for a little while. I was lead singer um, really? of a local band. Um, it was actually all able-bodied musicians. It was some, a buddy from my college days kind of called me up out of nowhere and he's like, Hey, we're joining a band and you know, where are you at? Do you still sing? And I was like, well, that's funny. I actually have just been really feeling like getting back into music. I'm in. And I started taking vocal lessons again, um, started working with that band and it was a lot of fun working with that band, but I'll admit it was difficult because they are all able-bodied. Right. And again, I was running into issues where I wouldn't be able to show up for a practice or something because of my body and they're kind of like where the hell's our lead singer yeah, don't right, blame them sure. because realistically you want somebody who's reliable and I'm I'm a challenge um so as much as I loved working with that band uh it, yeah it was it was a little bit difficult for me I think I'm, I belong more as a solo artist right. because that way I don't know I, I won't let anyone down yeah. if I can't make it to a practice right. <laughs> um but anyway, yeah, after that, that's when I finally was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm picking up the ukulele. I want to give this a go. I want to see if this works. And I was really surprised at, at how kind of naturally it came and how much easier it was. And again, I'm not, I'm no professional ukulele player. I can barely get away with playing in public, but I at least can a little bit. Sure. And it's also, it was also just a, a wonderful new way of making music because guitar songs kind of have a different vibe. Piano songs have a different vibe. Yeah. Ukulele songs have a different vibe. I was like, this is just nice to explore this avenue of creation. So yeah, yeah I, I know. guess I put ukulele in my own hand. <laughs> Excellent. You, you know, I've always, I've always thought this of VAMS is, and, and why it's, it's such an important organization because... Mm-hmm. It's definitely unique. Like, I don't know how many other organizations like VAMS are out there in other cities. Um, yeah, I, uh, 
Sorry, I just recently went to um, a symposium on spinal cord injury research, right. and it was sort of a collaborative affair where we had the scientists and um, and people of the community, like people who have, with spinal cord injuries, and then people um, like OTs and physios. Anyway, I was at my table discussing um, with some other people about these things, and I didn't even realize how lucky we are in, in Lower Mainland in Vancouver, right? For having the amount of programs that we have. Um, cause the woman, um, I think she was a physio, a physiotherapist of, of a nature. And she was like, yeah, do you guys have anything to do with music? And I was like, why? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver Adapted Music Society. In fact, just last night we put on our strong sessions and we had this guy out who, who has never been on stage before in his life. You should have seen his face. He lit up hmm. by being able to do that. And she's like, that is so cool. You just don't see that anywhere, yeah. anywhere around here. And other people in and these people were from the States, so I don't know how it is in the rest of Canada, but they're like, no, you, it doesn't exist in the States. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, it, it you know, it, it was the a passion project of a one person that, that, yeah. you know, just pushed it forward and, and, yes. and got it going. And if, if not for him, we it wouldn't have one happened. either. And that's what I was actually saying to her. She was like, oh, I wonder, you know, how we could get that going. And I was like, do it, do it yourself. She's like, yeah, but I mean, I don't have a disability. I feel like I'd be stepping on on feet there. I'm like, no, 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 no. Just somebody has to start it. <laughs> I mean, and that's the point. If you find a, a fellow musician who's got a disability who wants to do it with you, there you go. That makes you feel better, but somebody has to start it. And then that's all it takes. And, um, because it was Dave and, and, um, Sam Sullivan. Sam, Sam Sullivan yes. <laughs> um, it was their passion project together. Yeah. And I don't know that when they originally did this, that they imagined how you know, the scope, the depth of people that they would actually come to and inspire and, you know, and, and get going um, when it comes to music. And now I'm on the board of directors. I was, I was really, really pleased that I was um, invited to join. And I'm thrilled about it because if there's any way that I could do this for somebody else, what Vans did for me, I so want to be a part of that. <laughs> um, whether it's having somebody like me reconnect with something that they thought they had lost with a passion that's, you know, the, the love of their life or or in the case of um, um this fellow who who was up on the stage the other night and he had never played music before but he wanted to try and he got up there and he got to experience that magic right. that natural high that happens when you get up on stage and you perform for a live audience there's there's nothing quite like it well and i would think too something something like that participating in you know a vam's event would be a safe environment Yes. You know, so you don't have to worry about, you know, getting up on an open mic night at a, at a bar downtown with your guitar and, you know, getting beer thrown at you or ridiculed or harassed. <laughs> you know, you're in a safe environment. And so there's a, there's a process that would take place. Yeah, I think that safe environment is especially what's necessary um, at the beginning when you're a musician who has to do it differently. Um because I was, yeah, the first few actual live performances that I did um, post-injury were all disability community related. And I think that was essential for me because I just, I needed to know that if I screwed up, they would know why. Right. right. That it was not that I didn't try hard enough or that I haven't practiced enough. It's that I have limitations and, and different needs and expectations. So, yeah, I agree. Having that comfort zone really, really helped me for sure. And I can only assume that it helps other people as well, rather than getting thrown into the middle of the, mm -hmm. you know, the tiger den where you have all these able-bodied musicians who've been practicing for years. And then they're looking at you like, why can't you even hold the ukulele right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's every musician's goal to perform somewhere with that has chicken wire up around, around the stage, isn't it? Like, isn't that? But At I, least I once. Come on. That, you know, having said that, having said that it is a wonderful place and a safe place, an inclusive place, um, I really would like to see them progress further and further and show that not only can people play music, people with disabilities can play music, but people with disabilities um, can be successful at music. And not just do it as like a fun little thing, but be able to take it as a career path. Sure. Should they do. So that's sort of what I'm hoping. I mean, I've obviously people have already done it, but I want it to be, I don't feel like it's very obvious right now. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not nearly ubiquitous enough. I mean, it, yeah. you know, these things and the important message that I think that we on the podcast feel that we are always trying to sort of put out there is just that, um, 
it's important for people to realize that there are adaptive solutions out there for everything. Like, mm -hmm. you know, people, people who, you know, lose their vision or, or, you know, have all of a sudden they have mobility issues or whatever. And they think that, um, part of their, their previous life is, is gone because they're, they're not able to do it, whether that be music or sports or, you know, whatever, whatever your passion happens to be, there are adaptive solutions out there or there, the possibility of adaptive solutions are out there. We, we yeah. talked to, uh, we, we talked to a guitar manufacturer, Wheelie that, guitars, Wheelie guitars, um, who they're manufacturing these guitars. They're custom made to be able to fit, um, to a person in a wheelchair. Nice. So that they can play. You know, I did not know about this, and I need to know about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're called wheelie guitars, and they and they make all kinds of just beautiful custom guitars um, oh, that, that, that are that are made to fit. You know, it, ad adaptivity is just is is just innovation. Yeah. Um, there's really nothing, not a lot out there um, yeah. that is 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 closed off to people as long as we have somebody who's willing to put the work in to to innovate. For I mean, sure. that's why we have, you know, goal ball. We have, you know, we have murder ball. Yeah. 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 Wheelchair rugby. Murder Wheel ball, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Wheelchair rugby. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, no. Uh, yeah. There's, yeah, floor hockey. There's ice um, hockey. Sludge um, hockey. And I also work as a resource coordinator for people with disabilities. And that's something that I come across a lot is having these newly injured clients come in. And, and I hear that a lot. And I hear the pain in their voice because I recognize it. And I know it so well of I'll never be able to do this again. Mm. That's right. And I, I have to kind of bite my tongue and not push too hard because I know, especially when you're first injured, you kind of need to go through that grieving process and you are not ready to hear about all the adaption, um, adaptive solutions. Um, but I, I kind of nudge at them and like, just remember that when you're ready, come talk to me or talk to your rec therapist. There are ways. You just have to find out where they are. Well, and you know, it's uh, on last week's show, we had Rick Hansen on the show and he said the exact same thing. Sport was his life. And yeah. he didn't think that being disabled or participating in disabled sports was was the same thing. He just thought, well, you know, it's disabled sports. It's it's special. It's different. It's not as elite. And yeah. and he was wrong. Yeah. You know? And he came right out and said that. You know, once he started participating in it, yeah, like yeah. these are elite athletes. They're on, they're on the same level. They're, you know, it, it it can be competitive. Um, there are yeah. opportunities. For sure. And that, and again, it's just this, the able-bodied community and I've been that ignorant person and I don't use that word in a derogatory sense. It's just literally not knowing any better and not having right. mm -hmm. been, you know, educated to the fact that these, that that's the truth, that yeah. there are elite and I like that word. That's a really great disabled, um, athletes and elite disabled musicians yep. and that, yeah, it's just, finding a different method but you're still going to the same that's right summit, yeah you know? absolutely that's right adaptation there you know there it, there's no mysticism behind adaptation it's just literally you know a, a different way of doing something yeah and you know my buddy um digger dan danny sloan i don't know if you guys know him yep. uh, he does i like it's fascinating when he goes to do one of his busking gigs or or goes to a gig he's got like all this gear adapted and set up around his wheelchair that he can bring like a whole bloody studio where <laughs> he's going. But what I love about it is he's always looking for different ways and talking to different people and getting in. He's like, Hey, check out this new gizmo do that tool. I got now I can play my guitar like this. And I'm like, oh, that's cool because he just keeps looking for them and he finds the ways. Right. And you know, now he's, he's focusing on music full time because he can, because he found the way to do it. Sure. And, you know, and it goes way back. I mean, look at, you know, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, you know, all, yeah. all these incredible musicians um, that, you know, just had to do things a little bit different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And boy, pioneers. Yeah. yeah. I'm taking the easy road. All things <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I mean, I think, the, you know, the other part of this equation is just that, you know, I feel bad for cities out there that, that just don't have any oh, of these man. programs. And really, I, I think that the, the message to send is that all it takes is just one person. One person can really make a difference. Um, go Works out there, all. you know, yeah. you know, create something. Um, and, and even if it's a, you know, one room in a in a house, you know, start there and, and build build these programs for people um, because so it's so agree. important. 
especially yeah, after hearing all these stories about how it is down south and maybe in rural areas in, you know, in Canada where the access just isn't there because just communities are smaller. And I, I was almost tearing up as they're telling me about these places where people, you know, they basically get put to the point of um, you're breathing on your own. Now get out of the hospital. And then that's it. Mm. Never mind. No access to to all these programs that I ha- I can do anything I want. I I can go. I can if I want to play tennis tomorrow. I can go play tennis. If I want to go rowing, I can go rowing. If I like, I can do anything I want here in the Lower Mainland yeah. because, like you said, somebody at some point sat down and went, "I'm going to start this program." And to all those people, all I can say is thank you for giving us us Vancouverites all these options um, because I know. I am beyond grateful for bands yeah. and what they've done for me. And I mean, there's Wingspan too. Wingspan um, is another, um, oh, it's a complicated title. I can never say it. Sorry, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wingspan, she's, she's basically pioneering, trying to get a lot of um, musicians and artists of, of different kinds. There's Kickstart. There's, yeah, there's just so many that we have. That's How often do you perform these days? Truthfully, I don't perform that often, and I'm kind of okay with that. I'm an old lady. Uh, <laughs> this is the one problem that I'm going to have going forward, especially if I want to become more professional and I want to take this more seriously. Is is I love being on stage. Don't get me wrong; I absolutely adore it. But it's a lot of work yep. physically, and everyone always wants to stay up until two in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm in bed by nine. And I can't. <laughs> So I don't perform nearly as often as I might have if, you know, I wasn't so just an early sleeper. But, um, yeah, I still do perform probably at least once a month. Sure. Uh, and then that well, that's quite might... a bit. Yeah, actually, I guess so. Hey, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's not bad at all. And yeah. do, do you spend a lot of time sort of just just yourself, just just writing mostly these days? That's basically where I'm at. So what I'm trying to do is write a full length album because that's weirdly enough has not happened for me yet. And it feels absurd at this point in my life. And I realized recently that again, it was just me limiting myself. And so I learned about grants and there's apparently a ton of grants out there. So I'm just going to write and apply and cross my fingers because creating an album as it turns out, it's really expensive. <laughs> oh, bad. No way I can afford that on my own salary. Um, I have phenomenal employers, but I'm only able to work for part-time because, again, physical restrictions. Sure. Um, and Vancouver, it's expensive to live in. Yep. Oh, God. Tell me about it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's, that's basically where I'm at. I want to write and produce um, a full-length professional album. And uh, so I'm going to... Yeah, hope, hopefully get some grants, um, just save up as many pennies as I can. And yeah, that's my that's my goal. And then, then I want to, I was also thinking it could be really fun to try and do a YouTube presence. Mm, and yes. that will be my, my performances rather than maybe on stage. I could do my performances in the comfort of my own home. Right. Um, or just basically when I can do them. Right. And, I mean, I don't know that that's a successful business model for a musician, musician but I know it will be successful for me right? because again, I would hate to disappoint people if I had a performance and I have yet to actually miss a performance, but boy, have I been stoned on painkillers trying to perform <laughs> more <than> once, <laughs> hoping to God I still sound okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Hey, listen, if it, if it works for the Rolling Stones, I mean, you know, that they, <laughs> they, they've right. never performed straight in their lives. So let's be honest. <laughs> There you go. I just it works. Right in. <laughs> so you currently have songs on your website that you've recorded. Mm-hmm. Have you recorded those like in your home, in studio? And, yeah. you know, how many songs do you currently have? So, uh, well, written, I, I was actually trying to count it out the other day and they kept remembering songs. I, I don't know, somewhere around 50 songs that I've just written. Wow. Um, whether they're good or not is, you know, another story, but <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff that I have currently on my website is either recorded in my own home, um, believe it or not on an iMac, um, that I'm speaking to you on right now is actually what I did some of the vocals on. Right. I was really surprised at the quality that came out of a microphone that's sitting on the top of my computer. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, a few of the songs were, were produced by friends who, uh, were sort of budding, uh, producers. Right. 
So, um, but again, all in home stuff, everything that I've, that I have currently was done out of a bedroom or a living room, right? Nice. which is really quite interesting because some of the stuff kind of came out, like just the quality, the sound quality of what you can get out of a bedroom right now is, is pretty amazing. Yes. It, it is good. It is yes. a really good time, technologically speaking, uh, yeah. to be a, to be a recording artist because you really don't need a, a huge investment to get an actually pretty, you know, high quality, uh, recording yeah. out of it. Yeah. So that's also actually another, um, step, um, that I want to go towards is actually learning how to produce as well. Um, and I think that will also enhance my ability to songwrite, <clears throat> excuse me, if I'm able to, um, fully produce myself as well, it would be fun, but I'm, I'm almost weirdly enough. I'm almost hesitant to do that. And this might sound dumb, but I miss interacting with people. <laughs> yep. And I find that you can do absolutely anything completely by your own now, if, mm -hmm. if you want. Like you can YouTube it, you can Google it, you can get everything, you all the materials you need, and you can do it all without ever really saying hello to anyone. You don't even have to go to a store. You can get it delivered to your door. <laughs> That's yeah. true. And I, I miss the days when my dad says I was born in the wrong era because I'll ask people how to do stuff. And they're like, why aren't you Googling it? I'm like, because I'd rather talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather see how you do it. I'd rather hear your voice, see your smile. I don't know. So, I mean, I'm still going to learn how to produce my own music just because it's, it's, it's a curiosity and, and, and stuff for me. But I also kind of really want to produce my album by hiring, um, you know, a producer that's established and out there. I want to hire musicians and get their take in and get their influence on the music. And I want it to be more of a collaborative effort. Right. Uh, at least for that's, that's what my dream is for this one, which of course is going to take grants and lots of money because hiring musicians, um, and all that stuff, expensive, worth it though, but expensive. So, yeah, but yeah, I will eventually, I think, learn to produce my, on my own. Have you seen some of those loop recording artists? They're so cool. Uh, no, I don't think so. Like the, they just they the just people who like they'll start with like a little beat on their like they'll, uh, oh, they'll do like a little yes. beat on their on their on their desk and then they'll loop it and then they'll, right. they'll like, That's right. play to it. Yeah, they'll loop it and then yeah. they just keep adding these layers and yes. it's like I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so cool what they end up making at the end. Of the like they just whip it all together. They're like. Full, it's like one man band, the mm -hmm. new age form of a one man band. Yep. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of next for you then. So you're you're working on the album. Yes. Um, what about um, Vams itself? Now you mentioned the strong sessions. Um, that's a that's a, sort of an annual concert that you guys do. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I don't think we did it last year. Budgeting kind of can be an issue. As I'm learning now that I'm on board of directors, I'm getting a bit more insight into this. Um, I think, I think the goal going forward now is to try and make sure that it's an annual thing. Um, and if the funding come in and if we can get the support, we'd like to do even like maybe buy annually. So like do a summer, oh, nice. um, show and a winter show. Um, and the, the Vans is actually, um, so I told you they had that tiny studio at GS Strong. They're right. actually building a brand new studio, oh. which is going to be super skookum. It's also a, a GS strong, but it's in a much bigger space, which is going to be good because that just, um, just, just in terms of getting wheelchair users in there, mm, um, sure. the small space, it's just not very practical. Um, and yeah, very excited about that, about the brand new studio coming in there and who knows, maybe I'll be producing albums out of that studio once yeah, it's completed. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So yeah, we do have the shows. Uh, and I think, yeah, we, um, I know the Disability Foundation recently went through some changes and it's kind of exciting to see some of the, um, the, the pushes and the drives for new things that are kind of coming down the pipe. Right. So hopefully we'll see more and more music um, coming from BAMPs, more BAMPs sponsored events it would be really, really cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, anything that w we can do to get the word out about these organizations and agencies as well. Um, let us know, send us links, send us announcements, you know, we can yeah. tweet it and Facebook it because, you know, getting the word out and finding out about these things isn't always easy. No. Um, you know, when I lost my sight, I, you know, I was living in Kamloops at the time and I didn't know about BC blind sports, you know? Yeah. And so the more people that, you know, you can share the knowledge with, you know, the better. 
100%. And thank you, because that's, uh, again, as a, as a resource coordinator, um, that's something I'm, I'm noticing a lot as well, is that even though we have all these resources, it's communication and, 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 and marketing and advertising, it's actually really challenging. Yeah, I mean, right. I'm 10 years out at this point, and I'm still occasionally learning about things. Yeah. Like I just recently learned about Neil Squire Society's Tech at Work. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> I was like, what? How do I, oh my gosh. So I, funnily enough, just yesterday got um, my home studio area sort of revamped a little bit with a height adjustable desk and monitor arms just to make the place more um, accessible and right. to help me with my pain. Because before I was trying to work with just a wooden chair. And I can tell you that with chronic pain and a spinal cord injury, yeah. you don't yeah. last long. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and I'm a resource coordinator. Like you would think that I would be the through point for <laughs> everything, but no, it, it, there's so, yeah, it, well, more advertising for these sort of sorts of things would be great. Mm -hmm. I was lucky because VAMS was literally in the rehabilitation center and they drove by it every day in my wheelchair right. on my way to physio. So it was right there in my face. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, so many programs that right. would be helpful and advantageous if people just knew about them too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that's yeah, it's across every field. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and it and it is it is a shame. It, it, yeah. it's, it's the frustrating thing about even assistive technology, adaptive technology in general is just that a lot of people just don't think about it until the day that they need it, and it's yeah. <laughs> so it's it's hard to penetrate that that mainstream market that you need to to hit. In order for you know it, it to become real general knowledge that, that yeah. everybody knows about it, um, yeah. And there's no, I, I know there's a lot of people trying to. I know spinal cord injury BC is is a pretty good place where they there, there's no one pool I've noticed that you can just like Google or you can just be like I want this and then it kind of it comes up. Right. Um, it's a lot of this stuff is word of mouth still, and it's just through chatting to more and more people that you that you learn about different programs or, or different opportunities, but without that much. But if you're kind of, as a lot of people kind of can do, if you kind of end up in your home and you're not really talking to anyone, then you yeah. just think you're all alone. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, you listen, will you come back and talk to us when you've recorded the album? I would love to. Yes, or, or, or even maybe the next, the next big VAMS event. We're happy to have you on again and uh, we, and we can talk it. some more and promote it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, too. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Where, where can people find you online if they're interested in checking out some of your music? Uh, so I do have my own website, christinasheldonmusic.com. Um, but Christina with a K, Sheldon with an E-N, which I don't know what to do about because everyone spells it the normal way. So. <laughs> I almost want to, I think I'm actually genuinely considering making a stage name just so I don't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> but christinasheldonmusic.com. I also have a Facebook, um, a Twitter, an Instagram, all that jazz, um, if you're curious. But it's mostly just day-to-day -day dorky stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah. And, uh, I, oh, I also have a YouTube channel, um, that'll be revamping soon, but, uh, it has my latest song lost and found on it, Okay. which is a song that sort of, it's kind of about just trying to find meaning in this unstable landscape that we, that we kind of have, um, it's kind of just through the lens of life with a disability and trying to find love and meaning lost and found. Just a few things. <laughs> I should have practiced that little thing. <laughs> I didn't, but it came out really awkward, but that's fine. It's just like me. <laughs> I love it. Should we get her to play a little bit of ukulele on our way out? No. <laughs> you bother her. <laughs> Musicians hate that. They hate, like, play us a little something. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm one of those annoying people. It's hard to get me to stop. What we, what we really should do is we should commission her to actually come up with a theme song for us. Oh, dude. I'm we, in. We, we, <laughs> Okay, well, we'll see if we can raise some dough. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's even, what do you charge? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that off mic. Yeah. You can't talk. Um, we'll figure something out. Yes, we will. Oh, you know what? Let's. Uh, where can people find VAMS? All right. If you want to check out Vancouver Adapted Music Society's webpage, it's vams.org. Um, and yeah, actually through there, you should be able to figure out you can join. Um, we've actually started a new program uh a lessons program um so you can come in for lessons if you'd like oh no uh, if you just want to check out the studio um it's under construction right now but you're still welcome to go check it out 
and just learn more about the artists and the program itself. Yeah, bands.org. Perfect. And we'll, of course, include all of those links in our show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, Christina, thanks again for taking some time out and uh, chatting with us. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, you know, like I said, we'll we'll talk to you again uh, a little later when uh, you're a big superstar after recording your album. <laughs> Thank you so much. I look forward to it. <laughs> Have a good day, guys. Okay, Thanks, Christina, take too. care. Oh, what a lovely lady. Very upbeat personality. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I love hearing about that. And I just, you know, we are, we are so lucky in, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways with some of the programs that we have here, I have to say. Absolutely. Um, and it's just a matter of getting plugged into those resources. What's scary to me is that it's just, you know, it's one person. It's one person that started this up years and years ago. You know, well, two people, I guess, um, you know, Dave Simington and, and uh, Sam Sullivan your know, passion project for them had they not done that mm -hmm. it just wouldn't exist and it and it you know and it's like that in so many other cities where um you could have these programs that would mean so much to people yeah. in terms of um you know just confidence empowerment um, just being able to participate yeah. you know, just be just being able to participate in in a hobby or something that the that they're interested in you know, again, it's so important, and it's not that it's not that complicated. Adaptive musical instruments, adaptive equipment is just—it's not something that needs to be. Um, yeah, a lot of it's already out there, already exists. Absolutely, and even if it didn't, uh, it's not that hard to adapt. So, um, you know, I think it's a real important message to drive to drive to other people in other cities. Who, if something like this doesn't exist in your city, you have a passion for it. You know what? Start, start it. it up. Yep. Just start it up. Uh, we talked to so many different uh, organizations um, where that's that's how these things start. You know, Blind Beginnings started as a passion project from from a you know a CNIB employee, Sean Marsley. You know, frustrated that there weren't enough uh, programs for kids. So what did she do? She quit CNIB and she started up a nonprofit herself. And it's it's doing fantastic, and it does such fantastic work here in Vancouver. Um, uh, even uh, Cyviz, we talked to mm -hmm. uh, you know Dan Oates down down in uh, where is he Alabama, uh, Virginia, Alabama, somewhere, somewhere uh, uh, down in the states. Same thing, you know, started this up um, and and grew it over the years to be a, a real thriving event every year um, for visually impaired children. Yeah, there's no reason if you're interested in something, whether it's music, sports, arts, whatever, there's no reason not to get involved. Nope. There are, there are ways of doing these things now. Yep. Find, try to find something in your city, and if it doesn't exist, you know what? Start it up. Yep, because chances are you're not the only one thinking about it. Nope, that's true. So, all right. Well, we better get off this soapbox now. All right. Getting a nosebleed. <laughs> hey, Ryan. Rob. Where can people find us? They can find us at atbanter.com. Uh, they can also drop us an email, atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. I don't encourage anybody who has any sort of questions about assistive technology, if they have a technical question, something they can't figure out, you know what? Drop us a line uh, in, in our email and uh, we'll try to help you out, answer it on the show. Um, all right. Okay. So, uh, oh, hey, you know where else people can find us is uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right. Well, I think that's going to about do it for this week. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Bye. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll free at 1-844-795-8324. For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778-847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com. Music provided by bensound.com. Whoa, look at that. Master of the one take.